This is the Energy Education Podcast for the week of October 28th, 2012. I'm Kevin Hurley. This podcast is a project of Fairwinds Energy Education, a nonprofit whose mission is to educate policymakers, the public, and the next generation on matters of nuclear power and safety. Coming up on the show, the Eastern Seaboard braces itself for what's being called the Frankenstorm. We'll talk about what Hurricane Sandy means for U.S. nuclear power plants. Also, a new report identifies the Fukushima Triple Meltdown as the largest ever radioactive release into the ocean. We'll talk about that. Also, a major milestone in nuclear power approaches as one U.S. nuclear power plant prepares to shut its doors for good. Also, we'll talk about the Indian nuclear power plant Kudan Kulam, where protests are swelling as Indian authorities clamp down. To help make some sense of these issues, we'll be joined by Fairwind's chief engineer, Arnie Gunderson. Next. Could the United States experience a meltdown like Fukushima Daiichi? Will the mainstream media tell you the whole story about the nuclear industry? When you want answers to what's going on around the world in nuclear news, Fairwinds provides them. And your donations provide the needed funds for us to keep giving you factual information from people with industry experience. Please hit the donate button. This is the Fairwinds Energy Education Podcast. I'm Kevin Hurley. We're here with Arnie Gunderson again. It's the week of the 28th. Thanks for coming on, Arnie. Hi, Kevin. Glad I could. I want to start out talking about one you know, topic that we're receiving most of our emails on right now, and that's the uh, hurricane, Hurricane Sandy, and what, what that means for U.S. nuclear power plants. Should we be running for the hills? Well, the, the, you know, this hurricane is, is huge, and it's occurring at um, uh, the full moon, which means that tides are high. Um, but the, the, the real issue is, is likely to be uh, uh, the storm surge, which is essentially the, the uh, extra height in the center of the hurricane as the uh, water comes in um, and, the, uh, and the waves. And then, but, but more importantly will be the, the, the flooding, the inland flooding. The um, the waves and the storm surge will likely do a lot of destruction on the New Jersey coast, uh, but um, likely not do uh, too much damage to the power plants. My expectation is that it will be um, uh, it will be flooding related and um, and high wind related. But these power plants should be ready for that. You know the. Um, uh, the, the plant can withstand uh, relatively high winds, but the transmission grid can't. Um, that's all those transmission towers that are all over uh, the states. So uh, what, what's likely to happen is that the power lines will go down and the plant will suffer what we call loss of off-site power. And that's what happened at, at Fukushima Daiichi. The off-site power um, was eliminated. Um, at that point, the, the plant, um, if it's operating, the, the, the plant should, uh, will automatically scram because it's got no place to send its power. Now, when you say scram, that means to shut down the reactor? The, the control rods will go in real quickly, and the, um, uh, the nuclear chain reaction will, will stop. The plant needs to, um, uh, to drop its power immediately because... Um, th- there's no wire at the other end to, to, uh, to, to send it anywhere if the offsite power is lost. So the, um, what happens next, though, is that um, uh, the diesel generators have got to turn on because there's no other alternative uh, source of power. Some of these plants have two diesels, and some of these plants have three diesels. And uh, they're designed so if one of the diesels fails, they can, they can, they can still get by. You've talked before about loss of off-site power. I guess, can you just explain why off-site power is needed on the nuclear plant? Yeah, it's hard to imagine, but a a nuclear plant needs power to generate power. Um, It's got uh, ancillary systems that that have to run run off of power. And uh, so as it sends power out to the grid, it also sends some of that power back into itself to to run almost 5% of the nuclear power electricity is used to run the pumps that make the electricity. So um, when offsite power is lost, um, the, the, the plant is forced to dramatically reduce power real quickly 
and um, and then it's uh, it still needs to be cooled. You know, you'll hear uh, in the next two days that uh, we've shut down the plant. We've safely shut down the plant. Um, what that means is they've stopped the chain reaction. But what Fukushima taught us was that that doesn't stop the decay heat. There's still as much as 5% of the power from the power plant that doesn't go away when the plant shuts down. And um, for that, you need the diesels uh, to, um, to, to keep the plant cool. So if and when the plant loses off-site power, the diesels kick in to keep the plant cool and those diesels fire up no problem. Well, when I was at um, Northeast Utilities back in the 70s, we had a, a, a hurricane come in, and um, then we lost off-site power. The plant scrammed, and um, um, we had two alternative ways of producing power, and one of them didn't work. So we were down to one diesel, and um, we sat for six hours and um, on just one diesel until the, the, the uh, off-site power was restored and we could get uh, power into the plant to help with the cooling. It, it's, um, you know, the plant's designed to run on one, so um, of course the Nuclear Regulatory Commission would say everything was, was, was safe and sound, but I'll tell you, as, a, as the plant operator, as the, you know, the, 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 the people running the plant, it's a little bit of a nervous time to realize that you're on your last fallback. Um, it's, um, they just hope that the last fallback keeps running. What should plant operators and managers in these companies be doing in preparation for Hurricane Sandy? It would be better if the plants shut down before they lost the offsite power. Uh, as a, a hurricane comes, uh, uh, comes in, uh, they'll know that, uh, that, that pretty soon there's going to be high winds and while the plant itself may withstand the high winds, the transmission won't. So um, it would be better if the operators, um, instead of waiting for the power to fail, shut the power plant down ahead of time. And, and the reason for that is that um, when a plant scrams, that's a sudden shutdown, that's a pretty severe jolt to the systems and it's a challenge to the safety systems. Whereas if the operators can bring it down slowly over five, six, seven hours ahead of time, uh, that's less of a challenge. Sort of the difference between slamming on the brakes and coming to a gradual halt. It, it's less stressful for the power plants. So I'm hoping that the, uh, there's 26 power plants in the East Coast that are in the r area where, where Sandy is, is likely to hit. And, and hopefully when, as, as, as the storm track becomes better defined, the plants that are, are, are most subject to it, likely New Jersey and Pennsylvania, um, um, preventatively shut down. And that would, of course, um, um, minimize the, um, the, the impact, the jarring to the nuclear reactor and its safety systems. So in the event of uh, a loss of off-site power, you know, we're talking about the diesels and it's quite possible they'll be down to relying on their last diesel to uh, keep the plant cool. And that keeps the reactor cool. From Fukushima, though, we know that uh, the fuel pool needs to stay cool uh, as well. How do the fuel pools factor into this? The nuclear reactors are not designed to cool the fuel pool off the diesels. Um, and and the, the theory has been that, well, pretty quickly we'll get power back and we'll be able to cool the nuclear fuel. So. Um, um, the reason they didn't cool the fuel pool with the diesels is because those pumps require a lot of power and you need bigger diesels. So no one wanted to buy bigger diesels so they basically have penciled the problem away and said that well we don't we don't need those diesels for uh, you know six eight ten hours so therefore we'll figure out a way of cooling the fuel pool even though we've lost off-site power. Um, uh, that that's uh, there's a problem there. there's a lot of problems there as we learned at at, at Fukushima the um, the the fuel pools uh, especially this time of year some of these plants have recently refueled and they have hot fuel in their fuel pools um, the fuel pool churns off an enormous amount of moisture even in the best of circumstances and as it gets hot if the diesels fail and the pumps aren't on the the, the water will heat up several degrees an hour and start throwing off more and more and more moisture. Well, the buildings are not designed to handle high humidity. So um, uh, in addition to the, the, the fact that the fuel pool is warming up, you're throwing an enormous amount of humidity up 
into the um, into the air as well. And the last thing is the um, um, this was a, a study done by Dave Lockman back in the 90s. Uh, he discovered that the fuel pool liner seams are not really designed to approach um, boiling water. And in fact, they, uh, the, the, the stainless steel liners in the fuel pool may unzip if the water gets too hot. So uh, there's a lot of problems with allowing a fuel pool to, um, to overheat. And yet we've deliberately uh, built our nuclear plants so that um, the only fallback in the event the diesels turn on is to let the fuel pools um, begin to get warmer. And how long would it take for a fuel pool to boil? Well, it takes, depends on how much fuel is in the pool. All these pools are full. But more importantly, um, some of those reactors, those 26, have recently refueled, so they have hot nuclear fuel in the fuel pools. And in that case, it's, um, it's a couple of days. Mm -hmm. So Arnie, Hurricane Sandy, what's the uh, bottom line? What should people be thinking? Well, it's a big storm, and... Um, uh, it is likely that there'll be loss of offsite power for um, quite a few of these 26 nuclear plants that are um, th that are involved, and um, that means the diesels hopefully will all turn on, and uh, uh, at least one of them really must turn on in order to uh, to safely get through this. The chances of a of a diesel failing are less than one in a hundred. So if you have two diesels, it's one in a hundred times one in a hundred or one in 10,000 possibility of both diesels failing. Um, uh, that's not remote, um, but it's not, uh, I got a head for the hills today, um, uh, kind, of, kind of a problem. Uh, we need to keep track of um, what plants are experiencing loss of offsite power and hopefully management and the NRC is forcing these plants to, um, to preventatively shut down ahead of it. Uh, it's just less stressful on the power plant. Arnie, thanks for that update on the hurricane. Now, a quick change of topic. I know you received quite a few emails last week, uh, people concerned that there may be a fuel pool fire in Unit 4. Can you tell me just a bit about that? Yeah, we, we, we were inundated by uh, <laughs> phone calls from uh, as far away as Peru and, uh, and emails from all around the world. Um, about what turned out to be a hoax. Um, someone on the internet misinterpreted a bunch of data. And then other people on the internet uh, started to uh, take old Reuters stories from a year and a half ago and change the date and put these Reuters stories up. Uh, but it was a, it was a hoax and um, uh, you know, Fairwinds was, uh, we were constantly talking to reporters and people who called in as well as trying to respond to some of the emails. Um, uh, this is a case where um, uh, the, the, the internet, um, while it's wonderful for access, provided just, just awful data. You and I were talking right before the podcast and you expressed that you thought that this hoax drew attention away from a bigger uh, piece of news coming out of Japan right now. You know, there really was an important story coming out of Japan this week, and, and that was this um, report from uh, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute that talked about how much radiation is in the Pacific and, uh, and how it's not decreasing as they might, uh, they might have thought it would. There's a world-class organization based on Cape Cod called <coughs> Woods Hole, and they, um, they study the ocean. Um, they just came back from uh, the, the coast of Japan, and they found that the benthic organisms at the bottom of the ocean, benthic means the, the bottom-dwelling organisms at the, uh, on, on the ocean floor, are not seeing a decline in the amount of radiation that's, uh, uh, that, they, uh, that they're carrying. Now, um, they were very surprised. They had thought that... Um, the, the Fukushima accident occurred a year and a half ago, and they could go back now, and they begin to see a decline. So the the, the message is that the, uh, the 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 fish in the Pacific near near Japan are are still contaminated, especially the ones that that uh, feed on the on the bottom of the water. But the other message is that the uh, um, Woods Hole was surprised that it's not going down. Now they reached the conclusion the reason it's not going down is because Fukushima Daiichi is still leaking into the ocean. So that uh, even though the, um, the, the blast into the atmosphere essentially was um, 
you know, 95 percent of it uh, was done by April of 2011, the end of April 2011. Um, that we're still seeing the plant leaking into the uh, into the ocean. Now Tokyo Electric is building a, a wall uh, along the coast. It's going to be a hundred feet deep. It's not an up wall. It's a down wall uh, to prevent leakage into the ocean. But they're not going to be done until 2014. You know, we we talked on the other podcast about the fact that the uh, um, that the fuel pool is not going to be done until 2015. So Tokyo Electric is um, has, has quite a few problems, and they can't spend enough money on any of them to get them solved in a uh, in a quick quick way. So Woods Hole has come out and said that uh, this is the uh, certainly the worst release of radioactive material into the oceans ever in, in, in the history of nuclear power, um, and that it's not stopping. It's going to continue until. Um, uh, until these plants get rid of all the water that's in their basements. And at this point, the damage is done. And will continue to um, uh, uh, will continue to ooze radiation into the uh, into the water. You know that uh, Tokyo Electric now is. Uh, w- w- where is this coming from? It's a, probably a, a good question to ask. Where is this radiation coming from? It's um, the the nuclear cores are. Um, are melted down, and they have to be cooled. So you're pouring water across radioactive uranium and, and, and all of its uh, daughter products. That water then is leaking into the basements of all the buildings on site. They're sucking that water back out of those basements and pumping it back in to cool the reactor again. But in the meantime, they have a giant filter on it, sort of like the Brita filter on your sink, but huge that's trying to absorb some of this radiation, those filters get so hot that they have to be put into a, a, a football field sized place on the Fukushima site. They're running out of room to store the water. Within a year or two, there won't be any more room to store the water on site. Um, so uh, th- this problem is, is not gonna go away tomorrow, and it's not gonna go away even this year or next year. Um, and uh, likely water management is the uh, is the single biggest problem uh, with um, with Fukushima Daiichi and the assuming there's no earthquake the 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 biggest problem that um, that, that Tokyo Electric is going to be facing is the, is water management um, the, um, the the water continues to come in from the groundwater into these basements continues to get highly contaminated continues to leak out into the ocean and the filters they're trying to capture it on become so radioactive that they have to move them out to um, uh, to a football field on site, and uh, that football field is rapidly becoming full. So, um, uh, what to do in the long term with all of this radioactive water is um, is the biggest problem uh, that Tokyo Electric has to face, um, assuming there's no earthquake that knocks down Unit Four. So, still leaking. Still leaking and will continue to leak for a long time to come. Arnie, thank you. Let's now turn our attention towards India. India is home to the new Kudan Kulam nuclear power plant, which is being met by Indian citizens with tremendous resistance. Protests, unlike anything we've seen in the U.S. or Japan, have already resulted in hundreds of arrests. Uh, Arnie, can you talk about this a little bit? Yeah, they, uh, you know, we think of where are the nuclear reactors in the world. Well, of course, the United States has the most, France is next, and, and Japan is third. Uh, China is building quite a few and rapidly will, will uh, be, be a, a major player in, in nukes. But, but also, India has, has quite a few plants and is building quite a few more. Uh, the the Kudam Kulam plant is right at the southern tip of, of India. And the reactor that's there was um, was initially conceived in in 1988. Um, Nikolai Gorbachev cut a deal to to sell Russian reactors to India. Um, now it sat around for um, the 13 or 14 years, and they finally began building it around 2000. And um, so now, here, 12 years later, cost overruns up the kazoo. They are apparently close to ready to start up one of the reactors. Now this Kudam Kulam site is likely going to have six nuclear reactors by the time it's done. 
and the Indian government is is basically forcing these power these reactors on the people that that live there. In in Japan, when they uh, had reactors, um, the, the 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 people were co-opted into into accepting them. Um, but the public protests in India have been nothing like we've ever seen in the United States or in Japan. Now, you were saying that um, you know, 200 people were arrested. Um, well, it, it, people died. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, the security forces actually fired on the crowd a couple of uh, weeks ago and, and, and killed four people. So um, this is uh, thousands of people are showing up to try to prevent these plants from starting up. And um, press coverage is, is minimal. Um, a reporter was um, arrested this week for covering the, the incident. And the Indian government has been portraying this problem as uh, something brought on by outsiders, that India really wants it, but it's those, those, those mean people from America and from Europe that are, that are causing all the problem. Well, the tens of thousands of people that are showing up at that plant are, are not you know, coming by boat from, from India or America. They are Indians. Um, and the, uh, the government is uh, suppressing the information and, uh, and trying to avoid any, any public outcries as these plants uh, begin to start up. And of course, the population density around the plant, this plant in India, is much higher than uh, a lot of the uh, plants that we've talk talked about, a lot higher than Fukushima, I think, uh, a million people in a... Uh, 30 kilometer radius around the planet. Yeah, this, this is, um, I don't know that there's any place in India that's low population <laughs> density, but certainly uh, this is one where there's a, a, a million people within uh, 30 kilometers, which is 18 miles, um, and there's no way you could um, you could evacuate those, those people as uh, other accidents have shown us in the past. So, um, but the government wants these power plants to operate. So really, you've got a case where the, uh, the, the local people um, see the problems, but the government uh, wants the power. So um, it's, uh, it's one of these classic struggles. I, uh, and, and of course, by suppressing the information on the internet, uh, in, in, in mainstream media, actually, uh, it relies on you know, people like Fairwinds and, 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 and others, certainly within India, to, um, uh, to try to get this information out, that there is a, a large public protest that uh, is going um, unrecognized. Well, turning our attention, I guess, back to the U.S., I'll start at the U.S. and come back to the U.S., uh, a nuclear power plant is being shut down. The announcement came out this week, and uh, there's something significant about that. Can you talk about it? Yeah, it's really big news, and actually made the New York Times. So it uh, got to give <laughs> mainstream media credit here for um, for you know, one story in the New York Times. The uh, the Kiwani plant in in uh, uh, Wisconsin was uh, it was announced that they will shut down in March of 2013. Now, why wait till March? That that's when the fuel runs out. They would be refueling in 2013. Um, the plant is being shut down not because its uh, license ended. In fact, its 40-year uh, license would have ended in 2014, and it's already gotten a 60-year license. So the NRC said it was good till uh, 2034. But the owner of the plant, uh, Dominion Power, uh, said, we're not making any money. We're shutting this thing down because we're not making money. So we, you know, this has been this public myth of um, nuclear plants are inexpensive. Uh, in fact, um, these old single-unit nuclear plants are in jeopardy of, um, of being shut down. This is the first domino, but I don't think it's the last domino. A, a nuclear plant's got capital costs. That's how much you pay to, <coughs> to build the plant. And this plant, the Dominion paid $200 million for it, which isn't a lot for a power plant. Um, but then it's got operating costs, and this plant has 650 people working at it and um, fuel costs uh, as well. And uh, when you average all that out over a single unit power plant, um, the, the cost to generate electricity is just not economical. In addition, Dominion was worried about um, uh, Fukushima Daiichi modifications, so they didn't want to spend any more money updating this plant. It's not alone. I mean, we have here in Vermont, we have Vermont Yankee with a 
similar size, roughly the same staff, and uh, facing huge uh, Fukushima Daiichi um, uh, modification costs. Each one of these plants, uh, uh, Kiwani, Vermont Yankee, Pilgrim, Oyster Creek, um, and, and, and many others around the country, are, are privately owned. They're not owned by utilities. They're owned by business people. And, um, you know, the, the people at Dominion, this is a business decision. And it's not about being pro-nuke or anti-nuke. This doesn't make sense. And there's a difference. Last week we talked about plants that should be shut down. And, and that was Crystal River in, in Florida, uh, Fort Calhoun in, uh, in the Midwest, and then uh, San Onofre out on the West Coast. Those are, are uh, being paid for by ratepayers. They're, they're owned by utilities. And when a utility owns it, the utility board is close, is, is, in, is a cozy relationship with the people that own the plants. And when the plants shut down, they continue to pay salaries. Well, what happened here is that Kiwani, they realized that uh, they're what's called a merchant plant. They just sell power out on the grid. The cost of power on the grid was so much cheaper than what they could sell Kiwani's power for. They were losing lots of money, so they shut it down. Uh, I think we will see other merchant plants shut down as well as because these the, the, the companies that own them are not in the nuclear business, they're in the money business. And when the money doesn't make sense, they, they will shut down. There's uh, about a dozen plants in this category, you know, single unit plants that, uh, that don't make economic sense. They're too small and they have large staff, so their operating costs are very high. And uh, uh, you know, I think we'll see, uh, in addition to the Kiwanis, the, Vermont Yankees and the others that, that, that may topple as a result of the first domino falling here. Um, I think we're also going to see some, some uh, plants that are in the rate base, Crystal River, Fort Calhoun, uh, Southern California, Edison's, uh, San Onofre units. Uh, also take a look at this. Why are we paying 1,500 mm -hmm. people to be employed at uh, the San Onofre unit when it's not running? The San Onofre units, just this week, the California Public Utility Commission had a, um, uh, made a decision to investigate. And basically, uh, Californians have spent about half a billion dollars over the last 10 months, 50 million a month, to pay the salaries of these 1,500 people out of there. And the, the, the question is, what are we getting for our money? And the answer is nothing. So it may mean that Southern California Edison will be forced to give it back. Of course, whether the power plant is a merchant power plant or paid for by ratepayers, shutting it down also costs money. Um, decommissioning costs, how does that work? Well, at, at Kiwani, they are going to shut it down, but they're not going to take it down. Um, they're going to keep it there in, um, in a mothballed status. The, 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 the euphemism is safe store, um, although there was almost one meltdown in a plant in safe store. Uh, the Dresden One plant years ago. Um, the, the euphemism is that once we've shut it down and, and taken the fuel out of the pool, the plant is, quote, um, quote safe. Um, the plant could sit there for 60 years, the way the NRC allows it, um, and uh, um, until the funds become available. Now, what that means is these funds are in the stock market. And if the stock market continues to grow, eventually the theory is there'll be enough money to dismantle the plant. Um, but Kiwani doesn't have enough money now to do that. And so as a result, they're not going to decommission it. They're going to put it in safe store until the money becomes available. So they can't turn it into a Walmart or anything like that? Well, uh, yeah, the theory would be that they'd uh, t have this uh, into a greenfield. You know, the, 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 the plan is that you could turn it back into agricultural land or anything like that uh, after decommissioning. And, um, you know, what the people in Wisconsin are learning is that uh, that's not going to happen in, uh, uh, for years to come. Arnie, well, I guess that's about it for this week. We have uh, several new listeners this week, and I was hoping you could talk a little bit about who Fairwinds is and uh, what you do. Fairwinds Energy Education is a, a 501c3 not-for-profit, and uh, um, you know, we've done 
dozens of uh, radio shows, TV shows, uh, the the videos for which uh, eight million viewers have have watched um, over the over the last eighteen months. We would certainly appreciate um, uh, contributions from our our viewers so we can continue to do that. Maggie and I don't take any salary here. We we, we volunteer our time, but the infrastructure to keep a site like this going and to, to, to respond to all of the media requests we get does cost money, and we really appreciate it if um, if listeners and and viewers to our videos could uh, uh, could pass a little change on to us. All right, Arnie. Thanks so much for coming on. All right, I'm glad I could. Let's uh, all keep an eye on Sandy. This podcast has been a presentation of Fairwinds Energy Education and is made possible by the generous contributions of listeners like you. You can catch us back here next Sunday and every Sunday at 8 p.m. Eastern for a discussion on current world nuclear news. For Fairwinds Energy Education, I'm Kevin Hurley. Thanks for tuning in.